I'm here with Wharton Management Professor Tyler Rye and doctoral student Adam Castor, who are here to talk about their paper, Cognitive Neighborhoods and Evaluation of Innovation, a Cross-National Analysis. Welcome. Thank Welcome. you. Welcome, yeah, thanks. So tell us about your paper. Yeah, so in a nutshell, uh, this paper is trying to understand exactly how classification systems, um, which differ across countries, how that affects outcomes of innovation. In particular, trying to understand how the classification system affects how patent examiners search for prior art and how they find sort of what might be relevant or not relevant. So what are some of the key takeaways of your paper? So the, the key takeaways are that it's really important to understand how the classification system affects the way that uh, an innovator's innovation is going to be is going to be viewed and seen. So um, if it's assigned to a certain class, it's a, a class that is much more central um, and uh, much more related to other technology classes. It's going to be much more likely to be picked up by others uh, when they're doing future examination search by not only patent examiners, but also inventors. So it's going to be much more likely to be cited and probably much more likely to be hi more highly valued. So that's an important key takeaway. Yeah, absolutely. And I th you know, something that's interesting to keep in mind when we're looking at patents and classification and the valuation of intellectual property is that there's an assumption that the number of citations that a patent gets in future innovation is a reflection of its value. And what Adam's done really nicely in this paper is show that it's not just a reflection of the quality of the patent that's driving its valuation, but it really is where it gets slotted into the classification system. So examiners, like all of us, use heuristics and shortcuts to think about what's related and what isn't. And what we've done in the paper is actually modeled this out and shown the structural characteristics of the different patent classes in terms of how they relate to each other based on how examiners are searching. And the big takeaway is that the same piece of intellectual property, if it's in a class, uh, a patent class, that is in the neighborhood of many others, examiners are more likely to then cite it in future patent searches, and this is going to affect its valuation. So irrespective of quality, it's examiners, it's their cognition, and it's the properties of the categorization system that really seem to be driving valuation in an important way, as well as perceptions of what is a breakthrough technology versus what isn't. And, and to add on to that, another important aspect uh, that we find is that we're looking across different patent systems. So we're looking at the US, Japan, and Germany. And you can see that there is structural differences in the classification systems across these different patent jurisdictions. And that this itself, you know, just it, even looking at the exact same innovation being applied for in these different systems can have very different outcomes purely based off of, or at least in a strong part due to the fact that the way that the technology is classified is different. And so this is really important for, for practitioners to sort of be aware of. Um, and also just in terms of better understanding exactly uh, not only evaluation itself, but as Tyler was mentioning, um, what might be breakthrough and what might not be breakthrough. What's the best way to ensure that something might be a breakthrough? It's going to be seen by the most people going forward. So what conclusions, if any, surprised you? So I think for me personally, um, I expected that um, for technology classes that were very central, so were very related to other technology classes, um, I thought there would be a downside in the sense that um, if it's highly related, it might, distract, it might detract attention away from that focal class. Um, so if you think about a patent examiner inventor uh, who has a, a technology and they're looking back, um, if, it's, if, if the technology class itself that they're originally searching in is very broad, they might, they might not have as much time to search directly in that, in that primary class. So I was really expecting there to be sort of a negative effect as well, at least in terms of seeing that um, while it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to basically um, push attention further outwards, and I thought there might be a negative effect. What, what was surprising to us is that we didn't find that at all. In fact, um, what we do find that most of the, the, you know, the, the difference in terms of what technologies get cited more often than not comes from citations from outside the class. And there was actually no negative effect within the class itself, which I think for me was, was quite surprising. I thought there'd be some, some negative associated with, with sort of being more central. Yeah, and for me, my, my big takeaway is uh, you know, a little less complicated than yours, <laughs> uh, which I agree absolutely with everything you've just said. Um, but it surprised me that the same piece of intellectual property applied for in different systems is valued so differently. You know, you'd expect that there is some sort of underlying quality that's reflected in the valuation of intellectual property and the degree to which it's picked up and built on. 
And what we found is that, I mean, this is true to a certain extent, but depending on the properties of the classification system, this changes in really quite dramatic ways. And it, you know, it really speaks to the cultural creation of innovation and innovation outcomes. What are some of the practical implications of your findings? Yeah, so I think the, the, the first important thing to note, especially is, is sort of for practitioners to understand the differences across these systems. Now, um, I think uh, admittedly some of the research might be one step away from you know, really being able to explain exactly how should uh, patent applicants really proceed in terms of trying to maximize value. Uh, so uh, first, I think a first step in, a, in an area for future research is to understand exactly how much agency they have in terms of what classes are assigned. Um, certainly there is at least indicators that the USPTO, for instance, has a very strong hand in sort of affecting what the eventual primary classification is going to be, uh, which is what we're looking at. Um, but also, uh, when applicants file for a patent application, they're, they're required to include um, a, a class in their first application. So I think um, it's, it's clear that the, you know, the class is important. What we're, I think the next step is to understand exactly how much agency and what can uh, applicants do in order to ensure that their application their applications are going to be funneled into the classes that they want and be seen by the the proper examiners. So what sets your research apart? I think you kind of touched on that. Could you explain a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. So theoretically, there's a large difference in terms of the way that uh, classification understanding its use as a heuristic um, has been used. And so this context is very different because we're trying to understand uh, search and particularly search for innovation. Uh, so generally, um, Generally, the research is focused on consumers looking for specific products, uh, which is a slightly different context, one where they already have in their mind uh, a certain type of product they're going to look for, and so the dynamics are very different. When you're thinking about technology, on the other hand, um, especially in this paper, we're, we're looking at um, nanotechnology, which for a large part of the period that we're studying is, is a very nascent area, uh, is to understand exactly how do people make sense of these new technologies. And in particular, when they're, when they're searching, trying to understand how it's related, where, where might this new you know, piece of, uh, this new innovation or invention fit into this sort of broader sense? And, where might, and how might one frame it in order to best take advantage of, of the, you know, the, the institution in terms of its classification and other, other aspects or become really important? I think this is something that's, that's sort of missed. And, and more broadly, we have a much more fluid view of the way that these classification systems work. So um, theoretically, most of the research is sort of focused on how these classifications are sort of fixed in time, and all individuals really have this sort of the same premonition uh, or the same sort of cognitive schema of what these classification systems look like, whereas, whereas we're taking a much more fluid look and trying to look at how a new technology class, nanotechnology, is starting to become you know, sort of more mainstream and sort of how that affects the innovations over time. Yeah, and I th the only thing I'd add to that is I think that one of the unique things about this work that we're doing is instead of looking at individual categories or individual classifications, which is the traditional approach in the academic literature, we're really highlighting the influence of the properties of the classification system. And so we're taking a level of analysis from here and expanding it out to the broader topography of categories and how they relate to each other. Now, this leads to uh, some different questions, and this is part of you know, the basis for you know, wanting to undertake this research in the first place. Because the traditional prediction is that if you want to be understood and you want to be valued, you have to fit neatly within a particular category. And so this applies very generally to technologies, to people, to organizations. Uh, and there's a large literature that's looked at this. But what hasn't really been looked at is how the embeddedness of the category that you're in in a broader system of classification affects outcomes for you as a technology, a person, an organization, whatever it is. And that's really the piece that we're bringing to bear in this research, showing that, yes, it's important what category you're in, but really what's driving the effects, especially when valuation is based on being on the radar of lots of other things, is where this class sits in the broader system. What lessons um, are in your research applicable to venture capitalists, um, inventors, in businesses, are there any? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Just as, as Tyler was mentioning, um, oftentimes we think of it being necessary to sort of fit into a single category and have a very, very salient identity that fits into a, a single category, and that that is important to a degree. But especially for, I think, in particular, new innovations, uh, new technologies, is in order to garner widespread attention, 
you actually want to sort of sometimes appear more broad. So in particular, it might not be a bad thing. I think we're showing that's not a bad thing to actually fall into multiple different uh, classes because that's going to garner more attention. So I think fundamentally speaking, um, it's important to have a salient identity. But at the same time, I think our research is really going in the direction of showing that actually there's a lot of benefits to sort of spanning multiple different uh, classes, uh, product categories, et cetera, because that might garner more attention, which ultimately uh, might benefit uh, producers themselves and venture capitalists in terms of thinking about who they should invest in. And the other thing that I'd add to that is to the extent that venture capitalists or other audiences are looking at patent citations as a way to value uh, a startup's IP or even a, an established company's intellectual property, you know, they might be picking up some misleading stuff here. Uh, so doing close due diligence is probably still very important especially when you're thinking about something like nanotechnology that really is global in its scope and revolutionary in its potential. Unless you're actually getting under the hood and understanding the nuts and bolts of what this uh, technology is doing, what its potential is in the real world, you might be missing stuff if you're just looking at things like you know, the traditional measures of forward citations. It's picked up by a lot of other you know, innovations. This must be important. Or it's picked up by lots of diverse innovations. So this must be a breakthrough. So what we're showing is, you know, there's a piece to that that's true. But if you're relying just on that, you're probably missing a big chunk of what's actually driving quality in this field.